Uh, welcome once again. Today, well, last Sunday was Compassion Sunday, but um, we kept it going this week, too. And see, this is the shirt for Compassion Sunday. A child needs you. Hi. Um, yeah. My wife sat down next to me and saw the tissue box and goes, is it a crying day? (laughs) (laughs) Is it a day that ends in Y? (laughs) So um, our story is uh, 10, 11 years ago, 10 years, I I think it was 11 years ago now, uh, we had another one of these things, but it wasn't Compassion International, it was a different group. And um, we sponsored a child, and she'll turn 21 this year. And uh, her name um, is Wembabazi Sharon, but she goes by Sharon. And uh, so, you know, we wrote letters back and forth, and her her more than me. Um, It's the truth. Thankfully, with technology, with compassion, you can go online and send your kid an email, sort of. I mean, or you can handwrite it. But... Um, you can send them a message online because uh, we have kids with compassion now too. But anyway, back to Sharon. So um, she's in Uganda, and and all these years later, so she was like 10 years old when we first sponsored her, and like I said, she turned to 21. She uh, this year is graduating. <laughs> she's graduating uh, from university and uh, with a degree in status. Statistics. I have one in my pocket. That's, <laughs> do you want me to stop crying? <laughs> That's the unspoken communication. But anyway, sorry. Thank you very much for your care. Here, let me. I'll take one of these. I have two now, so you can pass those around. Thanks. Um, but last year, late last year, I got up one morning and uh, checked my phone because we're all slaves to the phones, right? And I had a friend request on Facebook from a Sharon Easter. I thought, well, I have a cousin Sharon. Um, but she's not an African girl in Uganda. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it was her. And um, I guess they have computers in university. makes sense. And uh, Facebook and modern technology. The world just, you know, every day gets smaller and smaller. So we've, you know, sent messages back and forth. And she said, I hope you don't mind. Because I... her real last name is it Easter. <laughs> She said, I hope you don't mind. I used your name because you mean so much to me. So, yeah. So, it, uh, you, you change a kid's life, life but it, it changes your more, yours more. I can't say I can all for a cleanse. I can't even talk now. Um, sorry. But we do have some kids that, that are looking for sponsors at the back tables there. So, please, uh, if the Lord leads you to stop back there and do that. And now... Excuse me a second while I shift gears. If you want to open your Bible to Psalm 23, that's where we'll end up today. Definitely, definitely, definitely. There we go. Definitely didn't want that amplified. So um, if you need a Bible, Ruth will get you one. You can just raise your hand. We'll pass that out to you. If uh, you want to keep that one, that's fine. If you need a nicer one, we have those at the information table. Um, if you're a guest with us today, please feel free to stop by the information table, get some information about the church and the things that are going on here, including a little gift from us. We are week two of Psalms. So last week, Pastor Frank Erb uh, spoke, um, opened up the series. It's kind of, I think, unusual to have a guest speaker open a series like that, but um, it was appropriate and uh, We know Frank. We've known Frank for a long time. We, meaning those of you that have been here for a long time and the pastors of the church who have known him for a long time. Um, He's one of those guys that he he works for the Capitol Commission now, um, bringing the gospel to the the state Senate or to to the state Capitol. um, But he's one of those guys that he spoke here early on. So this is kind of like flashback. You know, flashback, there was a a kids organization that came here. We sponsored a kid. He spoke here uh, when I was a young Christian coming to this church. It had uh, an impact on me with his speaking. And then I went to some of his Bible studies at the church that he planted. And and just really, it meant a lot, you know, to me. Uh, It helped me uh, grow spiritually. That like a year or two ago, I I told him that. And he was like, what? I had no idea. It's like, yeah, you know, you're, you're special to me. Um, 
So I just say that to, to say that you, you never know who you're going to influence in your life. And, of course, you want to do in, influence them in a, in a way that glorifies God and draws them closer to God, um, you know, by living your life uh, for Jesus. So just that encouragement. But he opened up. He did a great job uh, talking about Psalms. So I'm going to talk about this a little bit. Um, it, it's a series on emotions because um, emotional health is, is a very important part of spiritual maturity. If, um, you, know, you know, it's been said, if you're not emotionally healthy, you, you won't become spiritually mature. And, and so emotions are an important thing, obviously, because we have them, and, and God gave them to us. They're a natural part of us, and, and they can be used for good things, but sometimes we can go overboard with our emotions and not, not deal with them in a healthy manner, and it can pour out in different ways. So what we're looking at is uh, the book of Psalms. And the Psalms are, are songs, they're poems, it's, it's prayers prayers to God. People in different stages of their life going through different things in their life. Sometimes they're celebrating and they're joyous and they're thankful. In fact, we're going to talk about Thanksgiving Psalms next week. Um, today we're talking about Psalms of trust because the emotion we're talking about is fear. And so trust in God counteracts fear. And what, that's what we're going to do is we're going to look at, there's basically five different categories of emotions. And I know there's a whole range or a whole bunch of different emotions when we talk about fear you know, that is like the category where we can talk about worry and anxiety and um, all the other things that fall under that. Uh, so we're talking about broad categories and then the counter from the Psalms to those emotions so that we can deal with them in a healthy way that glorifies God. So speaking of this today, I'm going to open with a uh, quote from Franklin D. Roosevelt during his first inaugural address, March 4th, 1933. Was anybody there? <laughs> so first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Uh, if you weren't there at the time, see, my grandmother would have been 16, so she would have been in high school. My great-grandmother was 33, she probably had all of her five kids by then. Um, and been married for 17 years, actually, at that time. Uh, yes, do the math. I'll do the math. My great-grandmother was born in 1900, got married in 1916, had my grandmother in 1917, okay? <clears throat> so they'd come out of the World War, uh, gone through Prohibition, uh, the Depression, and now Franklin Delano Roosevelt steps up and says, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, fear that will stop us from doing what we need to do to press forward and do what we need to do to rebuild this country, to make it great again. And so it's the same thing for us. Fear can, can stop us from doing what God wants us to do, God really desires us to do, and the things that will help us to grow in our faith. Uh, in, from Psychology Today website, here's a quote. Fear is a vital response to physical and emotional danger. If we didn't feel it, we couldn't protect ourselves from legitimate threats. But often we fear situations that are far from life or death, and thus hang back for no good reason. Traumas or bad experiences can trigger a fear response within us that is hard to quell. Yet exposing ourselves to our personal fears is the best way to move past them. Okay? Fear, uh, we get responses. It causes us to fight or to run, which is flight, fight or flight, right? Or to freeze. And so those can be good things, is what they're saying, right, it, 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 to protect ourselves. So a fear that causes you to fight off an attacker is a good thing. Fear that causes you to run from physical danger is a good thing. Fear that causes you to stop before you step on that rattlesnake and get bitten, these are good things. Uh, but, but fear that present, prevents us from doing God's will in our lives, that's, that's a bad thing. It's a bad form of fear. Uh, peer pressure is another form of fear, okay? Fear of rejection, fear of condemnation, fear of whatever that peers cause us to do. Fear of, uh, <laughs> fear of the people's reaction that causes us to do stupid things, right? How many of us have, have succumbed to peer pressure uh, because and done stupid things, looking back now, because our friends double dog dared us, right? Yeah. <laughs> It's okay. If you were hesitant to raise your hand, I understand that that was in the past. It's sin. God forgave it. You move on. <laughs> Today is a new day. So, um, 
But so those are kind of bad types of fears, okay? And, and in the Bible, there's different examples of this. Now, in, in the book of First Samuel, King Saul, first king of Israel, not a very good king, not a very strong king. Um, God said, Saul, leave the Israelites to wipe out the Amalekites. Uh, they, they, they're bad. They've been bad for more than 400 years, and you are my instrument of judgment upon them. So wipe them all out, everything, uh, even their animals, everything. Well, he didn't do it. No. Uh, they took care of the people, but gosh, that sheep is so nice. And look at that cow. That's a, that's a lot of T-bone steaks, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> and so here's what he says in First Samuel chapter 15. Uh, because Samuel is the prophet, he comes up and he confronts Saul. So Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice, not God's, peer pressure. Okay? In uh, John chapter 9, it talks about a man who was born blind, and Jesus heals him, gives him sight. But at this time, he's got in conflict with the religious rulers in the temple, and they said, hey, anybody who gives glory, who talks about this Jesus guy, we're going to kick you out of the church, basically, the synagogue. So when the parents were called in to testify about this, you know, hey, did this Jesus guy heal your son? They're like, eh, we don't know. We weren't there. Ask the kid, because they were afraid of getting kicked out of the synagogue. So uh, they were afraid to support Christ. Now, in Matthew 25, Jesus tells the parable of the talents, where a, a, a ruler gave ten talents to one person and five talents to another and one talent to the third. And the first one, he multiplied it and made it 20 talents, right? Took 10 and, and doubled it. The other guy took five and doubled it. But the one guy who got one talent told him, hey, I know what a, what, what a, what a guy you are and, and that you make money where there's no money to be made and that people should fear you. And I was scared when you gave me that talent, so I buried it and did nothing with it. So fear kept him from doing his duty of at least putting it in the bank and earning interest. Okay? Fear. God calls us to live a courageous life for him. He told Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God is everywhere. You understand that? He's omnipresent, that's the word. That means when you walk out the door, he's there. And when you're sitting here, he's there. Uh, when you drive in your car, he's there. There's no place that you can go to get away from God. So if God is with you and God is for you, don't be afraid. That's what he's telling Joshua, and he tells us too. Uh, Jesus in John chapter 14 says to the disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. Okay, And Sean Hannity stole that line because he saw it was a good one, and he says that on his radio show every day. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus said. And then he said to him a little later, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Okay? Fear is a lack of peace, and peace counteracts fear. Worry is a form of fear. What does worry tell God? I don't trust you. I'm afraid, I'm worried about this situation. And instead of giving it to you and accepting your peace, I'm going to hold on to it. Okay? Paul, in Romans chapter 8, encourages the Roman Christians, and he says to them, You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And so before we... Uh, oh, wait, no, I've still got psalms to go through. I'm sorry. But before we go through these next psalms and then jump into Psalm 23... Uh, let's cry out to Abba, Father, and ask for him to open our eyes to this. Okay? Abba, Father, we thank you for all that you give us. Father, we do ask that you open our eyes to see that, that it's not just material things, but the very air we breathe, the very life we live, the fact that we are here today, Lord, are all gifts from you. You provide for us, and you give us abundantly Sometimes it's difficult to see that because we're in a world that measures things differently than the kingdom of heaven. But Lord, as we look at these psalms, as we look at particularly Psalm 23, help us to see what a good shepherd you are. Help us to see your love and that we can trust you and not be afraid. 
And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, in Psalms then, uh, I'm going to go through a few of them quickly. Psalm 37, verse 1. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. So fret is, a, like I said, a form of worry, a form of fear. Okay? Don't fret, don't worry, that Psalm says. 46, 2. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Psalm 112, 7. He was not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in God. This is the man or woman of God, right? They are not afraid of bad news because they trust in God. So the Bible has a lot to say about fear in our lives, and we know from experience there are many things we could be afraid of, right? Death and taxes. They're both going to happen, so why are you afraid of them? It makes sense, I understand, right? We fear loss of property. We fear loss of control. For some of us, that's very difficult, uh, loss of control, uh, loss of anything that we hold dear. Maybe it's a loved one. Maybe it's a possession. We can also fear people, right, and the things that they might do to us or, or their reaction to us or whether they accept us or reject us or fear of loneliness if there's no people in our lives. Now, granted, some of us think, wow, no people. That's a pleasant afternoon. But at some point, you need people because God created you to be in community and to be in relationships. And so, You name it, though, your heart can speak fear from those things. And uh, God has a plan, though, a plan for our lives uh, that does not include fear negatively affecting us. So let's look at what his plan is, right? First off, his plan for our lives or for fear in our lives is his presence. That's the first thing it includes. Because separation from God is a scary thing. And so we have Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 10. So here's the story. Adam and Eve, right? God created everything. He created the Garden of Eden. He's got the animals. You know, Adam's named the animals. He's got Eve. Uh, things are great, you know. Pharaoh's playing in the background. Because yeah. I'm happy. Right? Adam's just skipping along, man. Mm. All of a sudden, dinner. Oh, okay. Hey, Eve, what's for dinner? Here, have some fruit. Oh, great. <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm naked. What's the deal with this? Right? By that sin, by that disobedience to God's will, he now becomes separated from God. And the reaction then, when God comes looking for him, in verse 10 of chapter 3, he says, I heard the sound of you in the garden, because God's like, Adam, where are you? Why are you hiding? He says, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now, it, take it a step beyond the, the physical nakedness to the shame of disobeying God. You gave me one thing to do, or to not do, and I did it anyway. And so I was ashamed, and I hid from you. That sin separated Adam from God. But God doesn't want us to be that way, okay? God wants his presence in our life. He wants that relationship with us. That's why he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. Uh, so that's the first part of his plan, is that he is a part of our life. Uh, he doesn't want us to be afraid. Okay? The second thing, oh, sorry. When I say God wants to be in your life, okay, God is not the plus one on the invitation to dinner. Right? It's not you plus one God. It's God being a, a complete and central part of your life. Right? Being at the heart of your life in everything, whether it's eating breakfast, whether it's coming to church, whether it's taking a nap, uh, everything, God wants to be part of that life. Okay? That's his presence in all part of your life. Okay? The second thing is that he wants us to trust him, trust God, and fix our mind upon him. Um, in Je Isaiah, he writes, you keep him in perfect peace. So you keep the person in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So the one who trusts in you, God, you keep in perfect peace because his mind is fixed upon you. So God wants us to trust him and fix our mind upon him. Now, we sing different songs, and I'm going to say some of the lyrics because you already saw what my singing style is like, and it's not pretty. <laughs> Be afraid of that, okay? Uh, we sing, Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always on my side. And we also say, if our God is for us, then who can ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? 
So if God is with us, then we have nothing to fear against the things that are against us um, when we focus our mind on him. Now, uh, again, God is everywhere. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. And um, I was thinking as that video was playing, the, the lady was saying, this message will hopefully communicate to that little girl that you are loved, that you are important, that you are valued and someone cares about you. And, and the God who created the heavens and the earth and all that they contain feels the same way about you. You are loved. You are valued. You are important to him. So the last thing that God's plan for our, our life includes is his protection and provision for our whole lives. And we're going to look at Psalm 23. Now, let me just ask this question. How many of you have gone to a funeral a memorial service and had the pastor read Psalm 23? Yeah. Uh, every military funeral I did as a chaplain, I read Psalm 23. So we, we associate that with, with this psalm with, with that particular environment. But, but really, this is a psalm of trust. This isn't a psalm about, well, hey, the person's gone now. God's going to take care of them. That's true. But this is a psalm for us today, right now in our own lives. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want or I shall not be in want. Okay? That doesn't mean that uh, we get everything we want, but it means that we get everything we need. I shall not be lacking in the things that I need is a better way to say that. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. He's caring for me. He takes care of the things that I need. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Now, this particular time of year, you think green pastures, allergies, right? And you're like, that's not a really peaceful image for me, God. Maybe a, a green room with some nice air conditioning and nice filter system so I'm not sneezing. Um, but again, it's this image, this picture of God as a, as a shepherd leading his sheep to these green pastures, very attractive to sheep. I did a poll on the way in here. Nine out of ten of them said, yes, green pastures, we like that. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Okay? Two, two images are going to come out of this psalm. This is the first one, God as a shepherd. Okay? Has anybody here ever raised sheep? One, two, three, four. All right. Sheep and bass? You guys have done it all, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, turtles now. Awesome. So sheep are cute. My research has said also that they're not the smartest of animals. They really need a shepherd to lead them along to, to the green grass. You know, here, this is where we're going to eat now. Uh, and, and, you know, we drive through California. Of course, now everything's starting to be yellow and stuff. But think about the wintertime. A lot of green stuff here, right? Um, in, in Israel, not so much. Uh, there's a lot of desert. There are green pastures, and this is where the shepherd would lead them. Don't stop. It's a rock. Don't eat that. Come here. There's grass over here. Okay? So, so God's this shepherd that, that is protecting them from themselves sometimes, but from other things as well, leading them to a place where they can just settle down and, and be fed and not have any needs. Uh, all their needs are taken care of. Verse 4 now, okay? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and, and this is where, you know, we get this psalm at funerals and things, but even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So now God takes on this role of protector, okay? Uh, in these dark valleys, these, these little canyons and stuff that they would have had to go through to get to these green pastures, things hide behind rocks, things like lions, things like bears, uh, animals that want to eat the sheep, okay? Could be a very scary thing because, you know, they're used to being able to look all around and see what's going on, okay? They don't have camouflage. They don't have speed. They don't have any of these things to protect them. They got their eyesight, and they want to see if there's any predators coming. You get into this dark valley, they can't see that. 
So it's a scary thing. Now, many of us, I know, have gone through these, these dark valleys in our life, and I'm not talking about you know, necessarily physical things of where we're, we can't see things, but emotional things, um, traumatic things, illnesses, loss of people in our life. All these things are the same type of valley of shadow of death, this dark valley in our lives. And so this is why this is the comfort thing, because even though we're going through those times, God is with us. And, and when we have enemies outside, right, when we're afraid of attacks, when we're afraid of evil, when we're afraid of conflict or even death, God is there to protect us. It says, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. There's two things there. I know you might think they're both sticks, but the rod's going to be a little bit shorter, and, and it's used to guide the sheep. You know, hey, sh -sh -sh, not that way. Over this way, come on, right? Or smack, pay attention. God ever, God ever used his rod on you like that? Hey, not that way, dummy. I love you, but not that way, okay? So this kind of discipline thing, this guiding the sheep. And then the staff, you know, David talked about the time he was a shepherd. When, when he's going to face Goliath, the giant Philistine, he's like, I'm not afraid of that guy. I was a shepherd. You know, number one most hazardous occupation in ancient Israel. I, I, I was there, right? Lions would come, and I would take my staff, and I would smack them upside the head and, and make them drop my sheep and hit them again and scare them off. Bears would come, and I would chase them away with my shepherd's staff. So this is the image of God being this shepherd who's guiding us, his sheep, uh, to provide for us and to protect us, whether it's through a dark valley, whether it's enemies or attacks, all these things that we could fear God is there with us. So, these next couple of verses give us the other, other image of God. Okay, now we shift from him being a shepherd to him being a banquet host. Anybody like to eat? Okay. <laughs> you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. All right, that's the image of a, of a banquet. You know, a 22-course meal every... Uh, <laughs> 20 desserts, and then meat and potatoes. Um, <laughs> probably some bread in there, too, because bread's good. Um, but, but yeah, here's, you know, we're just surrounded by enemies, and God says, hold on, let's, let's top, let's have a party. Let me, let me put this table here. Let me fill it up. Here, your cup's overflowing. You're my honored guest, so I'm anointing your head with oil, because that's what they did back then. And, and so this is the image that God now becomes the provider protector as a shepherd, the provider as God, as a banquet host. Our cup is overflowing. And again, that's difficult to see sometimes, but especially when you think about, you made me go through all this to get here. Those are some dark valleys. Those are some difficult times. But now looking back, I can even see that you were working in my life then. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So we may fear eternity, we may fear death, fear what's in store after life, and, and here it is. God's going to prepare a table. Uh, chapter 15 of Revelation, right? Uh, we sing a song of Moses, and I've said that before, and this is the, the banquet, the marriage feast of, of the Lamb, Jesus, and his bride, the church, where we're in heaven, we're having a big party, and we're talking about all the great things that God has done in our lives. And so this is what we're looking forward to. Um, this is how we're trusting in God. We're trusting that he's going to protect us. We trust that he's going to provide for us. We trust that he loves us, that he's got this plan to overcome fear in our lives. So his plan, again, includes his presence, because separation from God is a scary thing. I lived in fear for 30 years. I don't want to cry anymore, so that's all I'm going to say on that. <laughs> but know God. Know God today if you don't know him. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. That's what it says in Romans. Don't live life separated from him anymore. It also includes trusting God and, and fixing our mind upon him. God is everywhere. He's everywhere, but he's revealed himself specifically <laughs> In, in his word, in the Bible, okay? And, and so there's no better way to know God and 
to see how he provides for his people, to see how he works in people's lives, and then to read the stories of the Bible over and over again. This is my favorite book of books, and, and I read it every day. You know, I read through it uh, at least a couple times a year because you guys give me more time now to do that. My previous employer didn't let me read as much, but now I do. <laughs> but when you see how God works in, in the lives of his people in his word and, and the real the character of God, and then you know, you're like, man, that's awesome. Uh, I wish I could see that today. And, and then that's when you start talking to people. Hey, God did this for me. This is how God worked in my life. When you see God through other people's eyes because they can see things, uh, and you'll see things in your own life that other people may not see, but uh, this is how we trust God and fix our mind upon him, spending daily time in his word and reflecting on that scripture. And then uh, it also includes, this plan also includes protection and provision for our whole lives. Okay? Now this, this might seem a little weird, but go with me on this, okay? Uh, picture yourself as a sheep little white fluffy sheep all right thank you thanks for the sound effects you're a sheep in God's flock now when you drive down the road and you see these flocks of sheep and if you you're not familiar with them then then drive out PFE and take a right going northbound on Watt towards baseline and there's usually some sheep right there okay so think about those sheep but picture yourself as one of those sheep do sheep ever look worried do they ever look anxious? Do they ever look in a hurry? I mean, the little lambs, they like to play, and they're all frolicky and stuff, and, you know, the mom's like, stop it. Eat some grass. Calm down. But they're not like, oh, man, when are we moving to the next pasture? We only got, like, it's almost, almost, almost lunchtime. Come on, we need to go. Let's go. Let's move. Let's, wait. No, change. You know, I can't wear that out in the pasture, right? They're, they're calm. They're peaceful. They're happy. This is really how God wants us to be. Not anxious, not fearing, but trusting that he is the good shepherd and that we are the sheep of his flock. So you can do that mental exercise. Now, at the bottom of your bulletin, there's some psalms listed there. Okay, These are psalms of trust. And, and no, well, there are some psalms that are, like, are completely in that category, but some have a lot of different things in them. But there's a list of psalms there, and, and you'll see it. And if you have a pen, you can draw, or you can just remember this, draw a line between 73 and 90, okay? And, and Psalm 73 and to the left, all the slower psalms, are individual psalms of trust. God, I trust you because, God, this is what helps me to trust you. And all the psalms 90 and to the right, the higher ones, those are community psalms because God loves each and every one of us individually, but he also loves us as his church, as his people. And so just like he loves David individually, but he also loved all the nation of Israel and still does. Um, you know, so he cares about each and every one of us, but he also cares about his people collectively. So these are different psalms for you to read this week. Okay? And then to put your faith in action, uh, this is an exercise to help you know God and feel his presence in your life. I'm going to ask the band to go ahead and come up now. Putting your faith in action. Read Psalm 23 every day this week. Okay? Six times. Seven if you count today. If you really want to cheat, you can say, well, I heard Mike read it, so that's today. Check. Okay? Uh, I'll give you credit for that so it's not cheating. But reflect on the way uh, in your own life as you read this. Reflect on the ways that God provides for you and protects you in your own life as you read that Psalm 23. Okay? Uh, now, we're going to have a video of a little girl who has memorized Psalm 23. So this is just to encourage you that, hey, if she can do it, um, that's great. I'm just going to read it. But uh, it's a joke. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> if she can do it, maybe you can do it too. But uh, it, it, we're going to play that while we receive the offering this morning. So there's a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to pray. Okay, I'm going to pray for the offering. If you're a guest with us today, please don't feel obligated to give. Um, we, we, we don't need that. Well, we don't need it. I mean, you're a guest here today, and guests don't have to pay for being here. Um, but if you're a member of regular tender, this is the way we worship, uh, by giving back to God. So uh, I'm going to pray for that. The video is going to be playing. The mask is going to be passed. You can turn in your communication card. You can turn in your offering. Uh, after I pray, I'm going to go back to that cross back there. And so if you've got any questions or want to talk to me about anything, uh, maybe knowing Jesus, then, then I'll be back there. Uh, maybe someone else will be back there, too, So um, to pray with you. But just so you know what's going to happen in the next couple minutes. Prayer, videos playing, baskets being passed, and then we're going to sing a couple of more songs, okay? All right. Join me in prayer. Father God, 
you are the great shepherd. Jesus, you're the good shepherd who, who protects and provides for his flock. Now, Lord, we know that you love us, and, and we see that because Jesus died for our sins. We know, like Adam, we are separated from you uh, because of our sins, but because of Jesus, we can have that relationship with you. And like I said, as we prayed for the ten most wanted, that's believing that Jesus died for our sins. That's accepting that forgiveness that is offered. That is making Jesus the Lord of our lives as well as our Savior. And so we can pray something as simple as, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner, and I believe that Christ died for my sins, and I believe that you raised him from the dead, and I accept the forgiveness that you offer because of that, Lord. I can't save myself, so you did it for me by sending your son Jesus. And so... I want that forgiveness. I want that life in Christ. I want to be part of your flock, Lord. So thank you for that. And Father, as we uh, receive these tithes and offerings, we thank you for those that uh, we can be the catalyst for gospel change in people's lives, that we can see you and your presence from this corner out into the world, out into the community, Lord, that we can see lives changed by the power of the gospel. So bless these offerings. Multiply them for your glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.